Hey, this is Bethany Sunday, and uh, because it's Bethany Sunday, uh, we want to uh, just do a little um, background of what Bethany is all about. I mean, that's our church namesake. We're, we're, we're Bethany Church. So what does it mean to be uh, somebody who's from Bethany Church? Well, it all has to do with the life of Christ. And I want to just kind of give you a, a little overview of the life of Christ here. And so uh, we, we spent a, a longer time oh, when we were in our three Sundays afternoons in February on the life of Christ. But we're going to do a little brief version of this. The life of Christ has two bookends. You know what a bookend is, right? Yeah. The first bookend, I call it the nativity of Christ. You know what nativity is? It comes from the word not. not we get natural, nativity, uh, all, all those different words. Uh, it means birth. It's birth. And so we start with the birth of Christ, then we have his childhood. We have a record of the childhood of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, where uh, Jesus, at the age of 12 years old, went to Jerusalem. That's all we have, 12-year-old little spot of Jesus. His birth, his childhood. The next thing we have is 30 years of silence while Jesus is in preparation for his ministry, for a public ministry. And so he's in the carpenter shop. He's learning the skill of being a carpenter. You know, he's probably nailed a lot of boards and doesn't realize that at the other book, in a, I'm sure he does realize, that he's going to have the nails go through him and be nailed to the boards. All right? We have his death on the other bookend, and we have his resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection, and we call that the Passion Week. So starting next Sunday, we're going to be beginning the Passion Week of Christ. We also call it the Holy Week. So we got these two bookends. Now, in between is the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in the book of Acts, it says, in chapter 10, it says, he went about doing good. He had a public ministry. Well, that public ministry was actually kicked off at the one end, uh, uh, right after the preparation. So right after the first bookend, we have the story of Jesus being baptized by John, and guess where it was at? The Jordan River near Bethany. Bethany. Bethany is the place where Jesus kicks off his ministry. And then we're going to see today that he kind of concludes his ministry. Because the week or so just before, some believe it was the Saturday before uh, Palm Sunday. I think that's too, too close when I try to do the chronology. But it's in that week or maybe a little bit more before that, just, just before that, where he winds down his public ministry by raising Lazarus from the dead. So I want to focus on Bethany uh, as it's up against these two bookends, and it actually frames the introduction and conclusion to his public ministry. Public ministry. It all started at Bethany. And it starts in John chapter 1, verse 19. It says, now this was John's testimony. Now John here is John the Baptist. And the question is, who is John the Baptist? Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Who are you? John the Baptist has a following. People are coming out. They're flocking out to, to be baptized by him. And so it's just natural that the leadership in Jerusalem would want to know what is going on because they felt like they were guardians of the law, the temple, and the religion of the nation. And so they send out a delegation to find out, who are you, John? And he did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. Now, not too far from where John is baptizing is the Qumran community of Essenes. And the Essenes who were writing about the righteous teacher, a Messiah who was to come. John is dressed a little more like them than he is the refined people in the, in the city. Uh, he's wearing camel hair and, you know, he's leather and, and he's eating wild locusts and honey. He, he's more like uh, the Qumran and the Essene community than he is like the religious polished preachers that are in Jerusalem. And so he comes right out and says... He assumes they're going to identify him with the teaching of those uh, groups that are out in the wilderness. And he says, no, I am not the Christ that they're teaching about. I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? 
Well, in the book of Malachi, it predicted that there was a prophet that was to come, Elijah. And it was also predicted, uh, you know, even before they were assumed, especially in those Essene community among Qumran and all of that, that there would be, because Elijah, if you remember the story in the Kings, he was caught up in, into heaven with a fiery chariot. And so they felt he was still alive. And they wanted to know, are you are you Elijah? You just popped on the scene. Are you Elijah? And, and the answer to that is, no, I am not Elijah. Hmm. Are you the prophet? Now this expression goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where Moses had predicted that there would be a, a, a prophet like unto himself that would come. And all the rabbis and teachers knew that this was a prediction of the prophet, the great prophet, Jesus. Not Jesus by name, but the Christ, the Messiah. And so this is a prediction. He says, are you the prophet that Moses spoke of that was going to come? And again he answers, no. Well, they're a little frustrated at this point, and they say, finally, then who in the world are you? <laughs> you get the picture? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Who are you? Now, think about it. When somebody asks you who you are, first thing you do is you tell them your, your name. But they want to say, no, I want to really know who are you? Oh, now what do you say? Wife, mother, what else? Oh, okay. You start to describe yourself by what? What you do what you do. They know that this is John. He's been called John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer. And he says, who are you? Give us an answer. We go back. So John responds just like anyone else would. He says, John replied with the words of Isaiah the prophet. He doesn't say who he is, but he tells what he's doing. What he's doing. I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. You know what he's, he's quoting Isaiah, prophecy, that he is fulfilling prophecy that before the Messiah would come, there would be a forerunner. And he would be declaring, the guy coming after me is the Messiah. And he was preparing the way. He's blazing the trail. Some believe this expression, make straight, means from taking something crooked and making it straight, he's really telling them to repent. And that was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your way. Get ready. The king is coming. The Messiah is coming. The one on whom the whole Old Testament had promised, he's coming. I'm the guy that is the forerunner. I'm the guy telling you that the next guy, he's it. He's it. So now they know who he is. They want to ask him why he's baptizing. What authority do you have to baptize? Now some of the Pharisees who had been sent, they question him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? It's very interesting because the Jews would baptize a Gentile who had converted over to Judaism, but they didn't baptize Jews, but Jesus is baptizing Jews. So they've really, this, this issue's got them really questioning what is going on here. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, why are you doing this? Why are you baptizing? He says, I baptize with water. John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy untie. Whew. John's got a ministry of humility. Humility, humility. John is a guy who says, it's not about me. I, I think we should say that. All of us together. It's not about me. It's not. He wraps his head around that. and He's wrapped his ministry around that. They're asking him to, to, to tell what he is doing. And well, I got this great ministry. I'm a great preacher. I got this great following. It's not about any of that. Later, when, when John's disciples are diminishing and Jesus is getting a bigger following, 
uh, his, this, John's disciples are a little concerned. And John says, he must increase and I must decrease. I think that's worth saying too. He must increase and I must decrease. You see, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about him. The question then is, where was he baptizing? This all happened at Bethany. Now, later in the book, we're going to find that Bethany is two miles outside of Jerusalem. A little less than two miles, actually. A little less than two miles outside Jerusalem. So I got Jerusalem up there on the map. I, I, two miles, I probably got it more like ten miles there. I don't know. But, but you, idea, it's, it's towards the Jordan River that you can see going up off the top of the Dead Sea. This all happened at Bethany, and then he adds these words. On the other side of the Jordan. Wait a minute. Wrong Bethany. On the other side of the Jordan. He adds that because there, apparently there were two Bethanies. You say, oh, come on. Really? Well, yeah. I looked up today. All right. Guess how many Columbus, how many cities are named Columbus? How many states have a city named Columbus? Yeah, there's 10 that have a major city called Columbus for sure. How many have Jamestown? Oh, my goodness. Well, the one is Bethany in Judea by Jerusalem, and the other is Bethany in Perea on the other side of the Jordan. So there's two Bethanies, all right? Someday maybe we'll have a satellite location. Wouldn't that be great? We'd grow so big that, you know, we can't handle it all here. We got a satellite location. We have a second Bethany. Wouldn't that be great? Well, actually, there's more than one Bethany church in the United States already. I mean, they're, they're, they're multiple. So there's two locations. He's saying this is where it happened. He identifies, and so I know that it's all happening at the Jordan River near Bethany. I'm saying this is so important to me because Jesus' ministry gets kicked off. Right now, we've only been talking about John. Jesus isn't in this picture here yet. But John's baptizing near Bethany at the Jordan River, and the next day, John saw Jesus coming and toward him, and he says to the audience there, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everyone knew about lambs. All the Jews knew about lambs. Every morning, every evening, at the temple, a lamb was sacrificed every day. Every day. At the Passover meal, you set aside a lamb. That was your meal. It was your meal to remind you of the Passover, the original Passover back in Exodus, where the lamb died and the blood was applied to the post and across the top of the doorway. And wherever the blood was applied, when the death angel passed through, it passed over that home. Everywhere else, the eldest male child died, the firstborn. And so it was called Passover because of the blood of the Lamb. John says, look, the Lamb of God. All those other lambs men provided. <laughs> if you went to the temple, you provided the Lamb. You provided the Lamb. At Passover, you set aside a lamb. You, you bought a lamb. You raised a lamb. You, it was your lamb. This lamb, man doesn't provide. God provides. He's the lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world? You know, all those lambs that they sacrificed in the temple, not one of them could take away sin. In the book of Hebrews, it says they could only cover your sins. They could never take away your sins. They covered it in the sense that uh, God looked down and he saw the blood and, and, and he said, a, a sacrifice is going to come eventually that will take away your sins. Until then, I'm allowing that to, to cover. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is a major proclamation at the very beginning at Bethany. At Bethany. He goes on, he says, now this is the one I meant when I said, a man comes after me. He has surpassed me because he was before me. Listen to these words. John was older than Jesus by six months. All right. So read this. A man who comes after me. Yeah. 
he's a, a, a relative, a distant relative of some sort, maybe a second cousin or, or beyond. He, he's related. He comes after me, but he has surpassed me because he was before me. He knows that Jesus is the Son of God, the incarnate one, that he is the one who is from everlasting. He is God come in the flesh. That's why I said, I am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about him. Jesus is baptized. I myself did not know him. Now this, this just got to scratch your head on this. Wait a second. You're a distant relative. Uh, you don't know him. This is what I think he is saying. I did not know at the time when he first came that he was the Christ. I just knew him as one of my cousins. I did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. This is the inauguration of Jesus into his public ministry. It takes place at Bethany. Jesus being baptized by John is to reveal that he is the one. And so he's baptizing all these people. And the reason he's baptizing, he's declaring to everybody that they needed to repent. Almost every theologian will tell you that baptism ultimately symbolizes that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. The person who gets baptized, no matter what mode you use, it, it goes to the expression, I died with Christ the moment I got saved. I was buried, and that's why we use immersion. We put you under water, so it's a picture of that being buried. When you come up, you're alive in Christ. Jesus being baptized is a picture of what is to come. Jesus' baptism as he goes into the water saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried. And when he comes up, I'm coming up out of the water with new life. This is so cool. He knows that he's going through that. When I got baptized, I was saying, I died with Jesus. I was buried with Jesus. I rose. When he got baptized, he said, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be buried in the grave. And I'm going to rise from the dead. Our baptisms unite us together. Isn't that awesome? It was done to reveal that he was the Christ to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. Just so I wouldn't miss it, God said, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And he said, I would not have known him except that the one, that he sent, the one who sent me to baptize with water told me this. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John, just in case you miss him, I'm not going to let that happen. There's going to be a theophany. Now a theophany, the word theophany means the word theos, God, Phani comes from the, to be revealed, a revelation, appearance, appearance of God. You've got the incarnate Son, you've got an appearance of the Holy Spirit, which is really rare. He takes on the form of a dove. He's not a dove. But there is some kind of appearance that he says looks something like a dove, comes down and rests on him and stays with him. It doesn't go off of him. The baptism was revealing to the whole nation of, of Israel. This is your Messiah anointed by God. The Holy Spirit has come upon him and is going to empower him. And he is the one who ultimately will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And we will see how that works on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, probably about 60 days from now. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is given to the church. And we have the same Holy Spirit. But he comes and he rests upon him. Now, Matthew adds, at this point, there's one more part to this. There was a voice that sounded from heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. All this took place at Bethany. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Stay with me. Second mention of Bethany. We go to the other bookend. All right? And in between these two is the whole public ministry of Jesus. He does his preaching, his miracles. Uh, and, you know, he goes about 
doing good, and, and he calls his disciples. He got all, all his whole public ministry is in between these two events. He's winding down his public ministry, and he gets bad news from Bethany. A man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, this is the other Bethany that's closer to Jerusalem. It's less than two miles away. So his sister sent word to Jesus. Now, they travel by foot, so probably one day he, he takes take a day to get over there. Somebody brings the word. <clears throat> the, the one, Lord, the one that you love is sick, they tell Jesus. He knows it's, it's Lazarus. And when he had heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in, in death. No, it's for the glory of God. So that God's Son may be glorified through it. He's not going to die. Well, that's not what he said. He said it will not end in death. It will not end in death. He stayed there for two more days. So the day in travel over, the two days, it's three days now. Then he told them plainly, uh, Lazarus is dead. For your sakes, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Then we skip down some more verses and on his arrival. I've skipped some things in there just to get the sketching the story here. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Okay, there was the day he died. The messenger left before that, gets there. They stayed two more days, a trip back. So it looks to me like right after the messenger had left, <laughs> Lazarus died. As soon as he had left to tell them the story. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and when Mar <clears throat> Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, <clears throat> said to Jesus if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Is that amazing? Her faith is so great. Jesus, if you had been here, he would not have died. She believes in Jesus. She does. But I know now that, he, he, I, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. There, there's hidden in those words. I believe that even now, you can do the impossible. You, you can do something about this. I know that. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And then she responds, I know that he will rise at the resurrection at the last day. Now, J Daniel chapter 12, verses 2, right through there, talks about the resurrection and the end times. And so she knows about the end time resurrection. She says, of course, all that, that, that are righteous will rise again. And so she knows that at the end days. And then Jesus makes this great statement. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Life, resurrection, living is embodied in Jesus. The Gospel of John started out, in him was life, and life was the light of men. That lightens every man. If you've got life, it's because it came from Jesus. You've already got life from Jesus. He is the life. He goes, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. You've heard this at funerals all the time, haven't you? Even he who believes in me will live even though he dies. Even though you physically die, you will live. And whoever lives physically and believes in me will never die because you will have eternal life. Jesus is saying to her, he's teaching her, he's taking this as a teaching moment. And then he asks this question, do you believe this? And I ask the same question, do you believe that? Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. This is the same confession Peter made that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe, I believe. After she had said this, she went back, she called her sister. And, and Mary uh, heard this, and she got up, and she quickly ran out to him. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she saw him, and she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he, he asked. Come and see, Lord. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. 
Prior to this, I didn't read the verses, but they were wailing and crying out. The term here for the word for weep is different from the other word for wailing and crying out. This would be that there was a tear that just trickled down his eye. He cried softly because he had lost his friend. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and the stone was laid across the entrance of it. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, said Martha, by this time there's a bad odor for he has been, been there for four days. The King James says that he stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh by now. Bad odor. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I should call this the prayer at Bethany. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. I call this prayer evangelism. He's praying because he knows that when the answer comes, it will generate faith in their hearts. That's why we have our outreach evangelism. We're praying that people will come and hear and God will work in their hearts. Jesus prays and said, I, I, I know what you're going to answer my prayer. I knew it before I even prayed it, but I did it. So when, when you do it, they'll know that it was an answer to prayer. You know, sometimes you pray, the answer has already been determined. God has determined everything. But if you don't pray, it was never an answer to prayer because you didn't pray. <laughs> you got to pray. And so he's praying here, so it'll be an answer to prayer. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And someone has said, if he had not said Lazarus, every dead person would have come out of the ground. Lazarus, come forth. The dead man came out, his hands and feet all wrapped, stripped in linen and cloth, and, and his face was all wrapped. And Jesus said to them, take off their grave clothes and let him go. And therefore, many of the Jews who had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. I want you to think about this. Bethany is associated with the start of Jesus' public ministry. And Bethany is associated with the end of his public ministry. At the first Bethany, we learn that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He took my sin away. At the second, Bethany, we learn that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He gives life to all who believe in him. He took away my sins and he gives me life. Isn't this awesome stuff? The first, Bethany, tells me he died for me. The second, Bethany, tells me he gives life to me. The first, Bethany, testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. The second, Bethany, they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Bethany, at both ends, starts and ends, with that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why Bethany Church, we say we're a Jesus-built church. We're built upon the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We want to be also built on the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, love your neighbor as yourself. We're also, a, a church says, built upon the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is the Son of God. That's where it all starts. We make that confession. That's why we got John 3.16 as our verse this month. Will you say it with me one more time? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Isn't that an awesome verse? You can make that great confession today. It's so simple. You just confess, Jesus, you are the Son of God who died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. That confession is the confession of salvation. Romans chapter 10 says so. Let's pray. Father, perhaps someone here today needs to make that confession. Just say, I believe that you are the Son of God. The one who died for my sins, the Lamb of God, who was buried and rose again with life eternal, the resurrection and the life. I believe and confess 
you are my Savior. That confession, Lord, we know if it comes from the heart, the faith will, will save. That's what Bethany's about, Lord. We know it. Everything in between, Jesus was demonstrating. He was that. It started and ended at Bethany. I pray, Father, that uh, we would be those who are people like those at Bethany who believed. I do believe. Bless us, Lord, so as we go forth from this place, we will share our faith with others, invite them to come to Bethany, that they might find the Lord Jesus too. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.